Good afternoon, uh, most of you. Good evening for some. Uh, thank you to Abdan and the and World Nuclear University for organizing this event. I'm very happy to be the moderator for this very important panel on investment and financing. Uh, Philip Cost, I joined the World Nuclear Association three years ago as a second D to Electricity de France. Most of my career had been in energy, nuclear energy, but also renewables and waste to energy. You are about 500 attendants, and that is huge. It clearly shows the interest for nuclear of the young generation, should it be in Brazil or and also in South America. That is very positive because nuclear plays and will play a key role to generate the large amounts of clean, safe, reliable, and affordable electricity the world is looking for. To that prospect, economics, investment, and financing are key elements to consider in energy planning. I know that MILT will develop the topic, but let me conclude this panel introduction by a consideration to the cost of capital in a highly capex intensive source such as nuclear. Having a cost of capital or WAC or financing cost of 5% will almost double the capex opex per kilowatt hour, while having a 10% cost of capital would, would triple it. Any way to reduce the cost of capital in nuclear project would be paradigm. Before uh, going with the first speaker, let me remind you that in, in any case, you may ask questions via the chat box in English or in Portuguese for translation will be provided. We shall try to add them to our speakers either at the end of each presentation or at the end of the panel. To activate translation, please click on interpretation close to the uh, reaction button at the bottom of your screen. To all our distinguished speakers, please make sure that you manage your presentation within the 20 minute time slot. I shall remind you uh, that you, when you will have only uh, two minutes left. Going to the first speaker, I mean, Milton Kaplan had been introduced to you early on uh, this morning, so I, I, I won't go anymore. He will present nuclear power economics and nuclear power structuring and financing. I mean, Milton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. See the sharing. I think everybody sees my screen. And good afternoon to everybody. Let me see if I can. There we go. Uh, and I hope you're all ready to have a very good session this afternoon, because we're finally going to talk about something that is interest is interesting to everyone. We're going to talk about money. I'm sure all of you are interested in money, where we get the money, because you know you think what's important to build a successful nuclear project is the technology. It's almost more important to have the money because we need a lot of money. So we're going to talk about that. Now we have a short time to talk, uh, just less than half an hour. And so I want to look at three different things after I give you a brief introduction. A very, very few minutes on electricity and its importance to modern life. And then I want to talk about a little bit about the cost structure of nuclear plants and then hopefully give you a path forward to project success, which will start to get the discussion going for the later parts and the later presentations and the questions and answers to come later. There's a lot of good reports that uh, I use when I prepare this material. The one on the left here is the uh, World Nuclear Association Economic Working Group report. It's a bit dated now, 2017 edition. I chair that, uh, that working group with Philippe. Uh, the projected cost of electricity generation the IEA NEA report is a very important report, but this, I still use this data, but the new one, because it comes, this one is from 2015, the new one should be getting issued any day and really coming very, very soon. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's there. We then have this report by the IEA nuclear power in a clean energy system. This is free off the IEA website from May of last year. Uh, we have the cost of decarbonization and unlocking, uh, unlocking whoop, reductions in the construction costs of nuclear, both from the NEA, which are also on their website and are extremely useful. So I wanna talk about, well, is there any way I can put this? Uh, there we go. I wanna talk about, 
uh, how we measure success. Because very often when we talk about costs and risks and all these things associated with nuclear projects, people can get very negative. But it's not about being negative. It's not about structuring projects to see who suffers the most pain when something goes wrong. It's about how we work together to drive success. So I'd like to use that word as often as possible. So for global success, nuclear has to demonstrate that it's competitive economically. Uh, we can talk about public acceptance and low carbon and reliability, but only a fully competitive nuclear industry will meet its full potential. The good news is that nuclear has been and continues to be economic relative to the alternatives in most jurisdictions, although there are local impacts. And as nuclear is capital intensive with long project schedules and has low operating costs due to the low cost of fuel, its cost of energy is very sensitive to both the capital cost and as Philippe just said to you, the cost of capital. Rapidly increasing the share of variable renewables is driving up system costs and requiring large amounts of excess generation. We'll talk about that. And as a system approaches full decarbonization, a system with nuclear is always lower cost than a system with renewables alone. And when I say renewables alone here, I don't mean hydro, I mean variable renewables, wind and solar. And lower and predictable nuclear plant costs can be achieved by aggressively managing project risk with owners taking on a strong leadership role. So those are the messages I wanna give you. So let's get started. Now, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this section because my time is short, but I think we all agree and we saw it this morning, the world needs energy and demand for energy is gonna to continue to grow. This is from last year's World Energy Outlook. Now, many have seen that this year has been a very strange year. The COVID crisis has reduced demand for energy. We've had a very large drop in uh, both energy and emissions this year. But I think one of the things we've realized is you know this is not a plus you know reducing carbon emissions by shutting down the economy is not the answer we need for our future but while some people may emphasize that demand has gone down i think what we've also realized is that our reliance on electricity has gone up so even though we're using less as people are doing less we could not be having this meeting virtually today none of you can be working from your home if you didn't have access to reliable, affordable energy for your home to enable you to survive this pandemic. So we need abundant clean energy, but reliable energy to secure our future. This is just showing you that electricity is the clean energy currency of the future and the fastest growing form of energy is solar. Now, when it comes to the low carbon as an option, nuclear power you can see here displaces more carbon than any other form of energy when compared to both coal and gas. And some people are surprised about this. You know, often people will tell you, oh, nuclear is clean, but you have all that carbon during mining of uranium and blah, 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 blah. The truth is this takes all of that into consideration and it shouldn't surprise anybody. Our high energy density means that even though you use carbon to mine uranium, you only need a very small amount of uranium to produce a large amount of energy. Also, we have to understand that electricity generation is complex. You know, people would love you today to assume, oh, we can just get all our energy from solar, or we can just get all our energy from wind, or we can do this, or we can do that. But the reality is that electricity supply is a complex is a complex model, a complex infrastructure. Electricity cannot be easily stored. So in current systems, supply and demand must always be in balance. So imagine those engineers 100 years ago that built these systems that were keeping these systems in balance. They really achieved a lot. And reliability is vital. You know, we might you know, get annoyed if the lights go out when we're in the middle of doing something Big businesses and industry cannot operate today if they don't have reliable energy. <clears throat> so you need a stable grid, which is a combination of reliable generation and reliable delivery. There's also huge variations in demand, both during the day and during the year. So today in the middle of the day, 
business is running. We have heat going on here in Canada and Brazil, maybe you still have air conditioning. And the, you're using a lot of electricity. At two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, people are sleeping, industry is closed, you lose a lot less. So the amount of demand moves during the day and it also moves based on the season. In some places you use more in the summer and some places you use more in the winter. Base load is that part of the demand which is steady throughout the day and year. And peak load is the amount that energy changes as the day moves up and down. And different generation options are suited to either base load or peak loads due to technology and economics. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, we're going to get all our energy from you know, generation type A or generation type B. And now we have, with a growing variable renewables on the fleet, their intermittency adds complexity to meeting this demand reliably. And the final point I want to make on, on the importance of energy is that developing energy policy is extraordinarily complex. You know, even though people think in many, many places, we heard this morning that in Brazil, it's basically a deregulated market, but that doesn't mean there's not policy. In order to have a market, you need a policy on market structure. You need governments want a policy on security of supply. Governments want a policy on energy poverty. It's not okay to say we're gonna put a price on carbon, but then certain people can't afford to use energy to cook their food. You need a policy on resilience. You need a policy on the environment and you need a policy that drives your industry to be internationally competitive. So those are just a few things to think about. I went through them very quickly because I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted you to get a sense of that. So let's move on to the cost structure of nuclear plants. Generation costs for most plants are really have three parts. One is the investment or capital cost. How much does it cost to build the plant that's generating energy? The fuel cost, how much does it cost to put the fuel in the plant, whether it's uranium or coal or gas, or in some cases like wind and solar, maybe the fuel is free. The operation and maintenance cost, which has a fixed and a variable component, but generally it's the people you need to operate the plant as well as some consumables that you use to keep the plant in good operating condition. But for nuclear, we've always had the full cost included in our economics. So in the fuel cost, we make an allowance for use fuel management so that when you get to the end of life, we can safely dispose of the nuclear waste. We also put aside money throughout the operating life so that when you get to the end of the plant life, we can safely decommission the nuclear plant and bring this plant back to a greenfield site. No other technology uh, allows for that in their economics. Now, when you look at costs in their time schedule, you can see that again, different plants have different approaches. Hydro plants cost a lot to build, but very little to operate. Nuclear plants cost relatively little to build, but most of the cost to operate is their price of fuel. Nuclear is closer to hydro, but we have higher O&M costs because we have large staff at the site. And coal, what makes coal such a wonderful fuel is it's kind of in the middle. It has average investment costs, average fuel costs, average O&M costs. Uh, unfortunately, it has environmental negative aspects. And renewables such as wind and solar have high investment costs, low marginal costs, but the resource is intermittent, creating something we call system costs which we'll get to. So when you look at the relative structure of generation, we usually measure that by using what we call the levelized cost of electricity. It's defined as the fixed price of electricity that will balance all of the costs over the plant lifetime on a discounted basis. So that means on a net present value basis. So for those of you that may not understand that, that means because of interest, uh, a dollar today is worth less than a dollar next year, is worth less than a dollar in two years because you can earn interest or it costs you interest to raise that dollar. So nuclear projects are capital intensive and have long project schedules. Gas plants are fuel intensive and coal plants are balanced. And you can see that in the lifetime, in the levelized cost of electricity, nuclear, most of the cost is investment. Gas, most of the cost is fuel and coal is relatively balanced. 
Now, in the projected cost of electricity, this is five years old and we're looking forward to seeing this updated. You can see that at least for the dispatchable technologies, coal and gas, nuclear tends to be very competitive in all jurisdictions. And you can see here Philippe's point that at lower uh, discount rates, it becomes more competitive than at higher discount rates. Now, if you wanna look at the sensitivity to some key parameters, uh, we already said these points. What's most economic when you compare coal and gas and nuclear is one, the fossil fuel price for coal and gas and the price of carbon if there is one, two, the interest and discount rate used, and three, the nuclear investment cost. So if you look, these come from projected costs of electricity. You can see that on the capital side, as Philippe said, the, the sensitivity to the cost of capital for nuclear is enormous. You can see that solar is the yellow line, nuclear is the blue line. And the reason, and if you look at the sensitivity to capital cost, which is the actual cost of the planet, sol solar is more sensitive than nuclear. So you may ask, well, why is nuclear more sensitive to cost of capital, even though uh, solar is more sensitive to the capital cost? And the reason is because of our relatively long project schedules. So you can imagine that if you have a five or six or seven year schedule during that time, your project cost is accumulating interest and that becomes a larger and larger component of the total cost. But on the other hand, you can see that, you know, gas plants are very insensitive to the co to capital cost and cost of capital. Now, the alternative is when you get to carbon price, you can see that, not surprisingly, coal is about twice as sensitive to the carbon price as gas because it produces twice as much carbon. So a rule of thumb, if, a, if you have a price of carbon of about $1 per ton, that will add about $1 per megawatt hour to the price of coal and about 50 cents to the price of gas. But here's what's new that wasn't incorporated in that report five years ago adding a substantive amount of renewables to the system changes everything. Why does it change everything? Because renewables are both not energy dense and they're intermittent. And the intermittency makes them not dispatchable. So for example, solar plants, and this figure comes from the World Energy Outlook from 2019, solar plants only operate on average about 17% of the time. So even assuming 20% of the time, that means 80% of the time during the day, you're not generating any electricity. Wind does better, it runs on the order of uh, 35 to 50% of the time, depending on the resource, but that still means you have a significant time of the day when uh, the wind is not running. And the important part is you have no guarantee so even though you are guaranteed, for example, that the sun doesn't shine at night, you aren't guaranteed that it will shine during the day. You can have a week of rain and very, very low solar. And that means you have to build a more complex system to address that. Now, when you contrast that with nuclear, it's at the other end of the scale. It generally runs 90% of the time, meaning that it's almost always available to meet the needs of an energy hungry system. And the Nuclear Energy Agency has done some work on this and I'm expecting in the next version of projected cost of electricity, we'll see more on this. So when you compare the cost of different generating options, the levelized cost of electricity is no longer sufficient. Why? Because when you look at, uh, renewables, variable renewables, there are system costs that have to be taken into account when you compare them with the options that don't need those system costs. So for example, you have profile costs. So you have to have backup available when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining. You have grid costs because you may have to build your wind plants or your solar plants far from load because you have to put them where you know the sun shines well or the wind is blowing well. And you have to deal with the cost of flexibility. So these are things that are very, very important. 
and have to be uh, included if you're going to do a proper comparison. And this is something new for the industry that tended to look at levelized cost of electricity as a simple way of comparing options. And what we can see from this MIT study that was done two years ago is that yes, it is possible to decarbonize without nuclear. So this, they did their study looking at various countries around the world. I just picked one. This is the New England area of the United States. And what you could see is if you include nuclear and they have two nuclear cases, a nominal case and a no low cost nuclear case, if you start with a system that produces about 500 grams per kilowatt hour of electricity, which is somewhat similar to what Germany produces today, you can see that the cost, whether you have nuclear or not, is quite similar. As you go down though and fully decarbonize, the cost of having no nuclear compared to having some nuclear, once you get beyond 10 grams per kilowatt hour, is very, very high. <clears throat> so you may ask yourself, well, why is that? And the answer is simple. It's hard to see on the right part of the graph, but if you look at the nuclear none scenario and you look at that black line, you can see that as you're decreasing the amount of nuclear, the amount of renewables is some, uh, the size of the system is somewhat stable, going from 35 gigawatts to 41 gigawatts. But the minute you go down to 10 grams per kilowatt hour or less and really start to pull nuclear out of the system, the size of your system has to increase so that, you know, with no nuclear, what was a 35 gigawatt system, you need 286 gigawatts for almost 10 times as much generation to get the same amount of energy. And if you look to the right, that's not the case on the nuclear scenarios, it stays relatively flat. So if you ask yourself, why is that? The answer is very simple. Just imagine you need to collect all of your energy to use for 100% of the time from solar. Well, if solar only operates 20% of the time, you have to build a lot, a lot of solar collection panels to collect all your energy during that 20% of the time that you need to use 100% of the time. And you need to have a storage system that's available to store it so you can use it when you need it. So these are the issues that have to be addressed today. Now, I know I'm going very quickly, but this is a short talk. And my last five, 10 minutes really want to show you a little bit about a path forward to success. So when I look at how to manage a project for success, I look at three elements. We have to be able to one, build a project to cost and schedule. We hear lots of noise about projects going over budget over time. Two, we have to find ways to reduce the capital cost, which is to make the plant more efficient. And three, we have to find ways to reduce the cost of capital or the financing costs. And so I'm gonna give you a slide on each one of these to give you something to think about. So if we talk about how do we build the cost and schedule, and people often make excuses saying, oh, you know, this project is first of a kind, so it was poorly implemented. And that's true, it is harder when it's first of a kind, but to build the cost and schedule, it's very simple, you have to be prepared. <clears throat> that means you have to plan, plan, and plan some more, and you have to <clears throat> ensure adequate design completion before construction, as well as make sure your supply chain is ready. You have to create strong project metrics and develop and implement a robust risk management plan, using it as a basis for project contingencies. You have to develop a project financial structure that supports preparation before final commitment. You know, one of the reasons so many projects have gone poorly is not giving enough time and spending enough money to get ready. The vendor has to do the best they can without spending enough money, and then they're open to too many surprises. And of course, nuclear is, again, it's not just a technology business, it's a people business. So get the best people you possibly can. Now, when it comes to structuring a project to reduce the cost of capital, because the cost of capital is a measure of risk, you have to remember as the project owner, and this is the truth for ANGRA 3, the risk resides with you. 
I think what we've proven is that transferring all the risk to contractors is an illusion. So when you transfer risk to others, they're allocating risk. It's a form of risk management. The risk does not appear. And I can explain that in one very simple sentence. There is no scenario where your contractor fails and you succeed. So no matter how much risk you think you put on your contractor, the minute he gets in trouble, he's gonna to come to you and ask you for help or else he fails and your project fails. The other elements you have to do is you have to have complete transparency through to the contractor then so that you don't get into a situation where the contractor says, it's okay, it's okay, things are fine. And then he goes, oh, it's not okay. You wanna be able to see problems when they're just starting so all parties can invest in solving them. And also you need to ensure adequate project oversight because it's good to have an independent perspective to people to ask the right questions. Now, where this comes from is a report coming out of the UK that showed uh, the same slide I showed you earlier, but in a real scenario. For Hinkley C, what would the price of energy be for different costs of capital? And you can see right now the assumption is their cost of capital is around 9% here, and the price of energy in their PPA is £92.50. If they could have found a model which can get them 6%, the price would go down to about 60. That's a massive change. So what you have to ask yourself when you're structuring is, is it worth paying the price to get someone else to take on that risk? And finally, I know I'm running out of time. How do you reduce the capital cost? And the capital cost is reduced through a very simple thing. Do the same things over and over again. Standardization. There's no doubt that we get better as we learn and do the same things over and over. And standardization goes beyond design. It includes, as Marcelo said earlier, build many on the same site, use the same supply chain, use the same project model, and mostly use the same people because learning is encapsulated in people, not in documents. You know, the recent example in the UAE, the fourth unit at the Baraka site cost about 40% less than the site average. Now, sometimes people tell me standardization does not allow for innovation, but I disagree. I think replicating allows for ideas on where there can be improvements in a managed way that can save both cost and schedule not throw everything out and start from scratch. So as we get to the end of this very quick overview, I apologize for telling you so much information in a short time. Lower and predictable nuclear plant costs can be achieved. And it's very simple. Build the cost and schedule by being ready. Reduce the cost of capital by managing risk in your project structure. Reduce the capital cost by building and repeating and continue to innovate. And that's the future of the industry. So this is what I want to leave you with today. In most industrialized countries, new nuclear plants are an economic option to generate baseload energy, even without consideration of the additional geopolitical and environmental advantages that nuclear power confers. Adding renewables to electricity systems changes everything due to their intermittency. That means that we have to reimagine systems and how we account for costs on systems. Fully decarbonized systems are always lower cost in every study I've seen when they include nuclear and successful nuclear projects result from investing in managing risk. So I think that's a good place to stop. Again, I apologize for talking so quickly, but I know we do have some time for discussion uh, at the end of this session, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, back to you, Philippe. Thank you, Milt. I mean, that was a very, very comprehensive uh, topic. I, 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 would, uh, I would say there was, I mean, two key issues, and that was uh, in your last slide. I mean, the system cost is definitely something to consider, and the risk allocation. I mean, uh, by having a different kind of a risk allocation, you, you, you may have a way of structuring differently and having a cost of capital, which is very, uh, which can be much lower. We, we shall turn now to reality with uh, 
uh, uh, NGRAS 3, uh, we'll, uh, we will have uh, Philippe Bordalo, who studied at the Ecole Centrale de Paris. I'm uh, happy to salute him as a fellow alumni. And in the Federal, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, he later specialized in economics and finance. Currently, he's project ma manager at BNDES, where he's co-responsible for NGRAS 3 project. And along with Philippe, Guillermo Garcia de Freitas, Charter Financial Analyst, has studied uh, industrial engineering in Pontifica Universidad Católica of Rio de Janeiro. He later studied at Fundacio Getulio Vargas, sorry for my mispronunciation of Portuguese, specializing in economics and finance and earning a Master of Science degree. Uh, he is currently a project manager also at BNDES in the company structuring and divestment division where he's co-responsible for Angra 3 project. Both Philip and Guillaume will present the financial model for Angra 3. Philip and Guillaume, floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Philippe. Thank you, uh, Milton Kaplan, for that great presentation you, you, you gave us. Uh, so um, uh, I will, with, uh, together with Guilherme, my colleague from BNDS, present um, the Angular 3 financial model. Um, we are working on that since uh, during the last 12 months. And uh, let us present a little bit about BNDS. BNDS is the Brazilian Development Bank. Uh, we work in the project structure, structuring branch of BNDS, which is characterized by a lot of industry knowledge, including nuclear energy, um, a great experienced legal team, uh, many capital market specialists, and a lot of and people with uh, strong quantitative skills um, that makes uh, BNDS a Brazilian leader in assessing state-owned companies for project structuring, as well as the, the three levels of governments uh, in Brazil. Uh, and just to make it clear, um, BNDS is very known in Brazil for financing um, uh, infrastructure projects and industry projects. Uh, we are not the financing branch, we're the project structuring branch. We have a very strong Chinese wall between these two branches. We cannot access them without some uh, restrictions. Um, so uh, I'd like to make that clear. So I I'll ask Guilherme to start uh, presenting the project, our contract with Electronuclear, uh, which is the owner of Angle 3. And then we will talk a little bit more about our studies and the financial model. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon and good evening for some of you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure most people here is already familiarized with Electronuclear uh, and the Angry Tree Project, uh, but I would just give a very quick highlight to make sure everyone is on the same page here related to the main uh, project characteristics. Uh, Electronuclear currently owns uh, three nuclear power plants all of them in the Angra site, and two of them are right operational, which are Angra 1 and Angra 2. Angra 2 is the reference uh, power plant for Angra 3 and is operational since 2001. They both use German technology, uh, originally from Siemens KW, uh, nowadays Framaton. This works, uh, the, the works of uh, Angra 3 started in the early 80s and uh, uh, they were already paralyzed twice. Uh, they reached a 62% completion and, and they have a, an estimated cost to complete of 15 billion reais, uh, which is something around $3 billion today. Since 2016, Electronuclear uh, and the Brazilian government are seeking for the, the best model to resume the works and complete the, the Angra 3 project. Uh, having that in mind, uh, the goal of the project we're talking about here uh, is to solve for the, the, the financial, the technical, and the legal structures that will allow for the resumption of the works and ultimately the completion and start of operations of Angra 3. Well, uh, for that, Electronuclear contracted BNDS 
to evaluate uh, three previous models that were originally ideal for the resumption of the Unger tree works and to, and to eventually recommend the, the, the final one. There is a two-phase approach in this structure. Uh, the first phase uh, was to define the best conceptual model for electronuclear and the Brazilian government. Uh, this means the general lines and the best ways for the project viabilization. Uh, for that, BNDS concluded in what this, uh, this slide calls uh, Project 2, uh, Conceptual Model Report. Uh, the, the analysis uh, of the previous models originally idealized. And, uh, and, and in fact, it recommended the fourth path, uh, which we'll uh, explain just in sequence. After that, uh, and the approvals of Electronuclear and the CPPI, uh, which is a, a Brazilian Council of Ministers, uh, the, the model had its steps and schedules uh, defined. And then we entered on phase two of the, the structuration. Uh, which is which will uh, scrutinize the, the details for uh, the implementation. I'll pass back to Bordal. Uh, so, um, trying to detail a little more about the three previous models that um, we find when we start when we started um, studying this project, um, I, I'd like to make a, a link. Uh, with what uh, Mr. Milton Kaplan said before, uh, when there is no good project, when uh, you succeed and your contractor fails, that's impossible. When you try to put all risk on, on, on the contractor, that, that risk uh, comes back to you. And that's exactly what we find, uh, what we found in these three previous models. Um, the, the, the main factor, main factor, um, the common factor uh, of the, those three previous models is that both construction risks and operation and financial risks were transferred to a possible uh, private partner, which uh, would be uh, in two cases, uh, a private shareholder of, of electronuclear that would take all the risk related to under three. So a market sounding was conducted between uh, 10, um, um, engineering companies with experience in constructing nuclear power plants and that market sounding indicated low attractiveness. In other words, the, those 10 potential partners um, asked some very costly compensations to electronuclear and ultimately to the federal governments, such as priority dividends, which under Brazilian law could imply a sovereign risk on over under three. Um, an, active part, an active participation on corporate governance, uh, guarantee uh, over the principal they invested in electronuclear and the remuneration at the cost of equity, which is higher than a cost of debt for the entire period of investment. Uh, and those uh, costly compensations would be put in place under a financial structure that, could, that would be a put option uh, against the federal governments that guarantee the, the investor to leave whenever he wanted with, with his principal and remuneration. So in other words, all those risks were um, going back to the federal government um, that would ultimately get uh, all the risks for and responsibilities for construction, operation and financing. That means it's a simpler, uh, the, those three models were simpler models, is relatively easy to put in place with low structuring costs because you're transferring all the responsibilities to this potential private partner. Uh, but as we see, we can see with a very high risk of execution. So uh, we started working on a fourth model uh, in this fourth model, we, we try to um, make an alignment with all the multiple stakeholders of the project, meaning, uh, of course, Electronuclear, which is the main sponsor, Electrobras, which is the state-owned company that controls Electronuclear, all the three main federal government institutions, the um, Economic Ministry, the, the Energy Ministry, 
and the Council of Ministers uh, PPI. Um, the current debt holders, meaning BNDS, not our branch, the other one, the financing branch of BNDS, Caixa, which is another state-owned bank in Brazil, and also with the potential partners of the project. And then we separated in potential lenders, meaning five important banks that works working um, on project finances in Brazil, project finance Brazil, and uh, potential EPC contractors. Uh, we talked with five um, from the 10 original potential partners, uh, which were Framatom, uh, the current owner of the technology, the, the German technology, uh, its controlling company EDF, the uh, French important energy company, the Chinese CNNC, the American Westinghouse, and the Russian uh, Rosatom. Uh, so the output of all those conversations that we had with these potential partners um, resulted in a, this, this new model that separates the partners in two different sets. So a financial partner, which will take part of the risk and responsibility for funding the, the project, the financial risk, and um, the EPC partner that would take the construction responsibility. So we allocate the risk in the agents that are more capable of taking those risks. The financial partner would be a set of banks, international banks, and also export credit agency with the funding capacity and the ability to, to measure those risks. And the EPC partners, a, a group of construct engineering companies that have an expertise in nuclear power plant constructions. So under this, uh, this fourth model, this new model, we will have equity injections from the federal government and from Eletrobras uh, to Eletronuclear to, to, uh, to compose the equity funding. And those financial partners would uh, inject uh, money in Eletronuclear uh, under a debt structure, under project finance structure. Um, and as I said, a group of private banks, um, ECAs, and also a, a public uh, bond issue. issue. Uh, we, will, we, we are also considering uh, uh, the current debt restructuring, meaning BNDS and Caixa restructuring their debts with Electronuclear. This must be uh, negotiated with them. And uh, EPC contractors um, under a normal EPC contract uh, to, to finish, to complete Angras 3. So this, we understand that this new model has, has uh, several advantages related to the, the previous one, which means that federal government and the lateral branch less exposed to risks since we are making a better risk allocation. We can achieve a larger set of potential partners since we're separating uh, in two groups. Uh, this better risk allocation facilitates the negotiation with the current debt holders for the restructuring of the debt, of the current debt, and uh, facilitates the negotiation with the federal government to obtain guarantees for the new, uh, new debt. Uh, we can still put in place uh, uh, private mechanisms of governance of the work um, such as uh, hiring an independent engineer to possibly settle uh, possible uh, uh, disputes between electronuclear and the EPC contractors. Uh, we can hire also an uh, owner and lender engineer to, uh, to, to improve the, the, this governance of the work. And, but uh, on the other hand, the, the disadvantage of this new model that we see is the higher structuring costs. But uh, uh, on our view, it's better to invest a little bit more in this initial phase structuring the project and have during the completion phase and operational phase, a uh, lower uh, level of risk uh, of over cost uh, overrun, cost overruns and, and delays. So um, as I just said, we, uh, we are aiming to invest uh, money and time in uh, deep and accurate due diligence, due diligence process uh, with a good risk mapping, uh, optimizing the, um, uh, the allocation of responsibilities between those multi multiple agents, having a clear 
definition of the interfaces between the work packages, uh, having clear contracts between all these agents involved in the in the construction, and having and having an optimal uh, investor segmentation, trying to achieve different kinds of investments with di different risk appetite. Uh, so all that put in place will um, mean a lower level lower level of risk remaining to Electronuclear and to the federal government, um, a lower risk of having a lack of interest among the potential partners. Uh, so, and that means also a lower risk premium uh, charged by those partners that could ultimately uh, lead, uh, I mean, uh, 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 increase in, in price energy. So all that put in place will mean a lower energy price to the consumers. Uh, so what are the answers uh, that we have to give to, to those potential partners? What, uh, what kind of information will make them reduce the risk premium charged to electronuclear and ultimately to the consumers of, of energy in Brazil? First, the APC partners, they want to know the current state of the project. Uh, they want to, to have a clear definition on the responsibility of each agent, um, the, a clear interface between the working packages rem uh, regarding the remaining scope, and um, and they want to know if Electronuclear has the financial capacity to honor those EPC contracts. And regarding the financial partner, um, the financial partner wants wants to know the level of risk concerning delays and cost of runs, because ultimately it, uh, they, those partners will take that risk too. Um, what, what are the mitigation strategies regarding those risks? They want to know it's very important if there are uh, hidden liabilities in the company a balance sheet or in, in under three projects. They also want to know if Electronuclear will have the capacity of honor the new and old debt contracts and they want to, to and uh, we want to optimize the risk and financing costs by trenches. So having a, a, a trench with some uh, with lower kind of guarantee, another trench with higher li level of guarantee. So assessing many kinds of investors with with different uh, guarantee structures. Uh, so I, I'll ask Guilherme to explain how we are. Uh, modeling the, the, these due diligence process to get all those info, all that information. Okay, so uh, to address the, the issues and answer the questions uh, Bordalo has just raised, we, we, what we need is detailed information to be available in a data room. Uh, so that EPC contractors and uh, the financial partners uh, are able to evaluate all the risks and to cut off all the, the, the uncertainties. And finally, to, to take a part in the final selection process. Uh, for that, uh, we see three packages of services need, uh, which we divided here in A, B, and C. Service A is the, the, the technical one, the one which will answer questions like, how's the conservation of already delivered equipments going? Uh, which, are, which guarantees are still valid? Uh, what do we actually need for completion? How much does it cost? What's the schedule? Uh, how do we allocate risk between electronic uh, and the, the, the APC contractors? So all of this is service A is the, the technical part uh, of the, the, the studies. Uh, service B, uh, we'll look at the company's numbers and the documentation, uh, and we we'll provide uh, the, necessary, the necessary inputs for uh, correct financial analysis. Uh, service B uh, will, will also be responsible for all the legal analysis and documentations uh, for the, the, the partner's selection. And um, service C uh, will, be, will be fitted with all those inputs and will directly work in the financial projections and parameters. Um, 
it, it will also seek for the best uh, fundraising and debt structuring in different tranches and uh, guarantees structures uh, like Bordalo uh, has put. Uh, and it, it, it ac actually aims for uh, maximizing value for Eletronuclear, uh, the project, and ultimately the uh, Brazilian energy consumer. If you could, we can go to the next, Bono, please. So uh, these services, they, they run in parallel and they, they impact on, on each other. And so how does all of this look like in a, in a timeline? Uh, well, the, the first set of studies uh, is, uh, is the due diligence processes, which will, will function as inputs for the, the, the final structure. As the longest due diligence service is the technical one, uh, which is estimated in around six months. Uh, th so, so this is the longest one, it, it will be the first one to, to start. Uh, technically, th this evaluation is split into two reports. Uh, I think we, we can put those together in a technical evaluation box. Uh, but the, the, the first one uh, would contain uh, the, the evaluation of everything electronuclear um, already has on the site. So it will, let's say, look to the past. And the second one uh, is the one which is looking forward into the, the, the future uh, to answer uh, which is the, the cost complete and uh, which are the schedules for that. Uh, then we have the other due diligence. Uh, these processes, uh, they, they take a shorter period, uh, something around two or three months. Uh, so, so they will start a little bit later than the, the technical one. Uh, and we have uh, running in parallel also the uh, valuation process. Uh, just to be clear, the valuation process they, they, to, to be finalized, uh, it needs the, the, all the inputs from the due diligence processes, both, uh, both the technical and the, the, the legal and financial ones. Uh, but they, they start, uh, uh, it, the process starts in parallel with the, the due diligence process. Um, we also will have uh, the, the financial advisory, uh, which will approach and deliver the, the, the financial preliminary structure. And the last piece we need then uh, will be the, the technical scope of the EPC contract and all the drafts of the, the documentation needed for the selection process. Um, with this whole picture, we have a detailed and uh, uh, scrutinized model that can be submitted then to Electronuclear and to the Brazilian government. Uh, and after the, the approvals and uh, eventual uh, adjustments proposed by them, uh, we will then uh, have the final documentation and parameters, uh, and we'll be able finally to launch the, the partner selections project. Uh, I think that's, that's all we have for today. Uh, I, I thank you very much for, for your attention and for your listening. And I will pass back to, to Philip. Thank you. Thank you all for, for your time and your patience. Thank you. Uh, do we have access? I have access to the mic, but not the camera anyway. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I'm just a little bit curious uh, regarding, uh, I mean, first of all, you, you demonstrated that, yes, now I can start my video. It is key, I mean, one of the key issues is a price to the consumers. Uh, that is, I mean, uh, what was shown in your slide and directly in reflection with uh, what Milton presented before, uh, without imposing too high a risk allocation on the final consumers. Uh, I would have maybe uh, just one question for yourself be before we move on. Uh, you, you mentioned, I mean, uh, uh, the different models that have been, uh, uh, and the fourth one has been chosen. Do you have any kind of comparison of the cost of capital in any of those uh, models? I mean, wh where do you end up with, I mean, on the th three first model and the fourth one? And, uh, and uh, another question I would have is on the time-wise, I mean, what do you expect on a time limit? Uh, 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 how much time would it take to be over with phase two? And what, what would be next afterwards? Philippe or, or Guillaume? Okay, I'll, 
thank you, thank you for those questions, uh, Philip. Um, regarding, let, let me start my, my video. Okay, regarding the cost of capital, there's a very important question because uh, the three previous models uh, um, concerns uh, uh, cost of equity level because the private partners would take the responsibility and risks um, under an equity structure, which we know it, it is higher than the, the weight, weighted average cost of capital. So uh, on the new model that we are presenting, the cost of, of capital would be uh, much uh, very reduced because much uh, the majority of the money would come under a debt structure from uh, the private partner set of uh, uh, set of uh, uh, the second set of private partners, which are the lenders that would put money in electron nuclear under a debt structure with the, all those different kinds of uh, uh, guarantee structures. Uh, regarding the, the second question uh, about the schedule, I'll ask uh, Guilherme Garcia to, to answer that. Okay, um, as for the, the timing, uh, it, it's important first, first to, to, to point out that uh, eletronuclear uh, is already beginning a, a critical path acceleration process, uh, which will run in parallel with all this, this bigger structure. Uh, so they are they are already hiring the, the the only the critical activities so that they will not lose the uh, the, the the deadline uh, that they have and the Brazilian government have of the 2026 uh, uh, start of operations of Angra Tree. So that the, there is another activity that uh, uh, is not uh, uh, structured uh, in, in this in this bigger process. Uh, that the electronuclear uh, is running in, in parallel, um, and 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 this uh, will, will make the 20, uh, 20, 000, 20, 2026 uh, schedule uh, uh, possible. Uh, as for this structuration, uh, we we think we can uh, still we have as as I said uh, a long. Uh, technical due diligence to, to, to take place, which will uh, take uh, something around six months. Uh, but we believe by uh, the end of 2021, uh, we will be able to, uh, to, to launch the, the, the partner selections process. Thank you. I cannot see any question from the chat. So I would propose that uh, we, we move on. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we, we have the chance to have uh, somebody from the Ministry, Energy uh, Mines and Energy Ministry. Uh, in presentation we had before, I mean, it is key that the role of government would be crucial to, to, to structure and, uh, and finance uh, all nuclear projects. So uh, I am pleased to have uh, Elton Majura de Almeida. Uh, who has studied mechanical engineering at the Universidad Federal do Espero Santo. And he has a master degree in economics by the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais. He used to be infrastructure secretary at the planning minister from 2016 to 2018 and public investment general coordinator at the Ministerio de Fazenda Agriculture from 2011 to 2016. Nowadays, he's a federal public servant, actually working as an economic assessor at Mines and Energy Ministry since 2019. Uh, Elton will present economics model and the search for economics alternative for the nuclear area. Elton, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you hear me. I'm going to try to do something here and get my screen up. Good afternoon, good evening, good day to you all. It's always quite difficult to talk after such qualified and skilled people, Guillermo and Felipe, they're such uh, experts in the finance for nuclear sector. 
and so it's quite a uh, hard act to follow. And thanks also for the detailed presentation by Milton. But I'm going to try to add some additional information that my colleagues provided. The Ministry of Mines and Energy has its planning for nuclear and our plan for long-term energy is a 30-year plan that considers expanding the number of plants that we have in Brazil, nuclear plants that is. And so it requires quite a lot of planning to build nine new plants in Brazil. And this has many challenges that comes with it. I would like to stress that Brazil is a country with a population that is still on the rise. We have about 220 million inhabitants and we have yet a lot to grow, especially by 2050. But it's not just that this population is gonna grow, but our per capita consumption is gonna grow as well. Brazil has great potential. Potential for growth and demand in for energy is gonna grow. This is going to be a, a situation that's going to give us a way to provide balanced energy supply. We need nuclear in this sense and Brazil has very few plants compared to other countries in the world from the United States, France, China, Russia, Japan, these uh, countries with the greatest economies in the world. And we have in our plan, what we have is that currently we evaluate nuclear energy use to meet that demand that is growing in Brazil. And here is our message. We have very little done yet and we have much to do still. And it's such an important route that we have to take as Milton mentioned. I'd like to spend a little bit of time right here in my talk, where I'd like to talk about some of the challenges for building new nuclear plants, particularly with regards to the model that we have. It's highly supported and structured with very large and important balanced solutions, but at the same time, we are going to have to take a look at this topic and have more debate to consider new plants in the future. We want uh, Brazil to have energy and we want to expand our energy grid, but we have some major challenges. And the first challenge that I'm uh, stressing right here is that I think we have a problem in Brazil, which is that nuclear plants are built by state-owned companies, federal companies that have to develop these nuclear plants. This in Brazil today is a situation where we have serious uh, financial restrictions. We don't have the tax inflows to make this happen and the capital to fund these projects and this dependence on the state really makes things difficult for you to develop new projects. But of course, we say no, we, we obviously can keep on developing nuclear projects, but of course, we have to design a new 
logic to see how we can deal with this restriction, this limiting factor. Another thing that we see is that we need to balance the risk exposure. So we have our hydroelectric plants and our nuclear plants and that have shown us that the risk is much greater than we ever initially thought. This means that it has had a major negative impact on the development of these projects. But it wasn't just on Agra 3, but also on our hydroelectric plants. We've seen the delays in the projects and the high costs. And in Brazil, a lot of our projects, they suffered with climate change. There's more limited use of these energy grids. And so what we need is a better outlook and a better understanding of our risk versus the return on these projects. Nuclear energy in Brazil ha deals with many different sectors, obviously the nuclear sector, and we have great uh, specialists in this area. But here in Brazil, we're also talking about the nuclear submarine. We have projects for mining. But in my third item here, what we need to ask ourselves is how do we monetize things? How do we get potential gains from all these synergies? How do we earn from nuclear electricity? but we still aren't making money off of this major source of energy. What we need to do is find a more objective approach for this kind of synergy. We need to discuss, in my perspective, we need to discuss how the earnings can come from the energy sector and how the nuclear plants can produce more earnings. And then finally, this is my last point that I wanted to point out. These are some slides that I have prepared, but obviously I've got lots of questions, but at the same time, I'm pointing things out. These are things that we're talking about in the nuclear plants. Nuclear energy in Brazil and these nuclear plants, we need to turn them into protected costs. We have two things that we have to talk about, which is uh, how to tax them and how to give them more independence. We want to be fair, but at the same time, we, we need to do something on the tax side. For example, here in Brazil, uh, cars were often considered in terms of their tax burden. We need to look at the size of cars and the minute that we start thinking about the size of the car and its engine, then the taxes go up. And so we need to choose the right kind of um, technologies so that we can't have a tax burden that keeps us from having the energy sources that can meet the demand of our population. And so we have to think not just about the price, we need to think about how we can uh, make sure that the tax burden is lower than other sources of energy like solar or wind gas, others. And so we do have a debate that needs to happen when it comes to tax taxonomy or tax burden. We also have brought up the taxes that go to each different sector of the economy in Brazil. And this also leads to distortion when it comes to looking at the most competitive energy source, which obviously is nuclear. And 
Brazil is still behind on this game in a major way. And so we see that there's smaller and mid-sized energy plants that have incentives, tax incentives. And so we need to think about competitive pricing. That's something that we discuss all the time. And so we need to discuss this more in terms of the tax burden for the different sources of energy. And then I left this nice blue box down below with a wonderful question, how to be competitive in a deregulated market. How, and it's my challenge to you. How can we make this energy source competitive so that we can get through this regulation? So we can open the energy market and this way our consumers can be free to choose where they're buying their energy from and who's providing it. And so we need to have an open market in this sense. We are walking through a very large uh, group of opportunities and Brazil has to think about how can we put the this nuclear electric option within the options that are available to our consumers. I think that the message that we have is that we have to tell people that we have this major source of energy that has characteristics and features that really make this energy considered to be one of the most important. And that, of course, there's uh, costs for reliability and uh, the recharging and it reduces carbon emissions, but we also have a challenge. We have to show the economic uh, benefits and we have to provide the economic incentives to make this more interesting. And finally, my last slide, I want to show you that there are still some natural competitors for nuclear here in Brazil. So we have talked a lot about the energy grid in Brazil. Here in Brazil, we have a lot of understanding about this energy grid. But in my mind, I think that we have a very high level of understanding. And uh, we have lots of renewables here. It's ridiculously high, 84% of renewables. That's very high. And we have a country with lots of water. Obviously, that's why we have the hydroelectric dams. You know, this is a country that has problems with feeding all of its population. But when it comes to water, we have lots of it. And so it's pretty incredible. It's a country with lots of potential for uh, oil production. And in the Northeast of Brazil, for example, it was pretty impressive that there's so much energy in the Northeast. We imagined that there would be much more even, but you know, they have different sources, including wind energy. When you have the intermittent uh, energy sources, uh, we, we see the, the problems with that. But anyway, we also have other uh, growth in other sectors like solar. And that's very important. This, uh, we have this distributed energy dis uh, production and the distribution is generalized. And this is a trend that we see in Brazil and Brazil has lots of, of subsidies for energy. And so we need to make uh, prices more efficient. But nevertheless, even in this uh, distributed generation, we see that uh, the prices are high and they're going up. Brazil is taking, uh, is tapping into its oil reserves and uh, also getting gas, natural gas. 
but we believe that we have many other ways of generating electricity besides gas. And so the other place that we're going to see a drop is the coal of burning gas, uh, coal burning plants and electricity coming from them. So we look at nuclear energy and we look at it in terms of our grid. And we are convinced that this project is important, that this is a project that when we look at our energy sources is very important for Brazil. And I think that the Brazilian nuclear program, including ANGRA 3, is something that requires more of our energy and more of our effort so that we make this energy source more competitive and we can deal with some of the market distortions that we have in Brazil. We have lots of renewables, I think way too many. I think we have the natural resources to make renewables useful. But in that sense, I also think that we are very proud of our electric grid. Now, these are my initial comments that I had for you. And I'm here at your disposal for any kind of uh, comments or questions that you might have for me. Thank you, Elton. I mean, uh, you really demonstrated that there is a uh, lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities in the energy system in Brazil. Uh, maybe a, a little bit far away from my moderator role, but I would say just a few things. I mean, definitely you tackle the issue of the transmission. Uh, you have a lot of hydro, but I'm pretty sure that there is a, a long transmission grid, so it means high cost. Uh, you, you tackle also the, the social economics, and this is of great importance. And I'm pretty sure that, I mean, looking at all energy, as the way you were saying, regarding at all social economics benefits you may have, uh, you'll find out that, for instance, nuclear may provide a lot of uh, social economic benefits to the country, hosting country, because lots of localization, uh, long term jobs, uh, well paid jobs, uh, use of natural resources uh, on, on land. So I really think that, I mean, you've tackled the challenge, but you've been looking also at the, the, the key issues to be looked at. I don't know if we have a question. There was one in uh, Portuguese, but I cannot uh, read it. So maybe we, I'll keep it for the end. Uh, I will move on to the, the, the next speaker. Uh, Mauricio Chacour is an engineer with a post-graduation degree in finance and administration. He, he, he has a career, he was career employee at BND, yes, where he has held several management positions, the last of which was head of the compliance and risk management uh, division. He also worked for the state of Rio de Janeiro government, where he was secretary for economic development and CEO of the state financial agency. Currently, he is an advisor to the CBRAE RG board. Uh, Mauricio will present on the technologic arena challenges. Uh, Mauricio. Well, thank you, Philip. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good uh, evening for some. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this event. And I'd like to thank Abida and WNU for the invitation. And um, that my, let me share the presentation. Okay, I guess everybody's uh, seeing the, the slides. Um, the idea here is to talk about uh, the methodology that you use for uh, foster small companies and introduce them to the nuclear energy sector. Okay, uh, but before that, let me talk a little bit about Sebrae. Um, Sebrae is a private non-profit uh, organization whose mission is essentially to support micro and small companies and foster entrepreneurship. Uh, 
Okay. Sebra is present throughout the country and counts on <clears throat> hundreds of service points and more than 6,000 employees across the country. And that is who we are and how do we support the small companies? Well, Sebrae trains, advises, promotes innovation, promotes market opening, um, provides consultancy. Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, we don't make loans but we guide us on assessing credit and many other services to increase and strengthen the small business in Brazil. Okay. And um, who do we support? Um, there are 11 million, 11.6 million small form of business in Brazil. These are our, these are our clients. The segment represents 90-90% of formal establishments and employs more than 50% of Brazilians with formal contract. Uh, here in Brazil, we use this formal and informal way to say because the informal economy in Brazil is very strong, is very important. Some economists say that it represents almost 50% of, our, of the formal economy. So that's because we always talk about formal and informal. And uh, according to Sebrae, more than 50% of Brazilian exporting companies are micro and small companies. So it's important uh, uh, public. But, but they were responsible for only 1.2 billion US dollars international trade. So looking at to that, uh, Sebrae saw a uh, great potential to force a small business. And then uh, Sebrae has prioritized the internationalization uh, in this strategic plan. And one way to achieve this goal, we think that could be working with the nuclear energy sector. But why the nuclear energy sector as a partner? Uh, in this morning, by the way, I, I heard, I guess, Mr. Mr. Kaplan said that the, uh, it is an exciting time to be in the nuclear area, in the nuclear workspace nowadays. And I agree with him. Um, let's see some highlights about the sector. And uh, when uh, Ailton showed the, his slide about Brazil's number and international numbers, I checked the numbers and they are very similar, so it's okay. <laughs> um, PNE means the National Energy Plan 2050. It forecasts eight to 10 gigawatts, new gigawatts in nuclear energy in Brazil by 2050. So it means eight new nuclear power plants to be built in Brazil. Besides that, we have the expansion of Angra 1. We have the modernization of Angra 2. End of construction of Angra 3. There is a project of building a mode purpose reactor. We have more than 50 billion US dollars investments in the next 30 years. And besides that, Brazil controls fuel cycle technology. That's a very important uh, issue. In terms of the, the, the world, um, some word highlights. The international market, it's uh, forecast the building of 158 new reactors by 2013. It means it represents 1.2 trillion US dollars in acquisition in the domestic market and international acquisitions of 530 million US dollars, huge money, huge money. OECD forecast reduction in carbon emissions and that 62% increase in nuclear energy by 2040. More than 50 countries use nuclear power, power in 20, 220 reactors for research purposes. 
And nowadays we have 50 reactors under construction in the world. So that is a very strong uh, uh, sector, dynamic sector. And uh, we, 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 because of that, seeing that, seeing this potential, uh, Sebrae start to work with Abdan. Uh, Abdan is the Brazilian Association for the Development of Nuclear Activities in Brazil. And uh, this is a very prompt sector. And uh, we will create these numbers, these highlights, shows that they will be create a thousand of opportunities. And they decide to work to bring these opportunities to small, small entrepreneurship, small enterprises. And we believe that the best way to do this is through innovation, technology, and uh, very competitive products and service. So, as I said, we start to work with Abdan, and now with them, we are developing the, the following. Our support for the nuclear energy sector together with Abdan. We are studying the internet, planning the internationalization of the energy sector in Brazil. We have a project in Apex, uh, studying session in global supply innovation chains. We are organizing the nuclear trade and technology exchange together with Abidan. That's a very huge event in Brazil next year, probably in the middle of next year. And you have the technological arena. That's the, the aim and the reason of this, this uh, panel here. And I'm, I'm going to try to, to explain that. This is a methodology and that's the way we um, we try to we are going to support small business to insert things in global supply and innovation change. Um, it's nothing more than a program for acceleration and internationalization of companies. Okay, uh, focused on development of technological solutions for large companies. Uh, based on innovation. In other words, with the arena, we seek to develop technological solutions generated by, uh, oh, sorry, uh, in other words, with the arena, we, we, we think in developing technological solutions and generate, generate new business with global competitiveness. Um, that can succeed internationalization of the small companies. Okay. Uh, to carry out the technological arena, we are working with these companies that we call the anchor companies. There are four Brazilian groups that Amazul, Eletrobras, INB, uh, Nuclear Industry. Brazilian industry, Brazilian nuclear industry, and ATEC, and working with three multinationals. That's Rosaton from Russia, Westinghouse from USA, and Framaton from France. Uh, the idea is uh, the the program is a kind of win-win program. Uh, because the big company presents technological challenge for small companies, uh, which will receive training, support, financing, and the small company will strive to solve the problem to the big company. The concept is simple, but it requires huge work, a lot of work. Here you can see that if you come from the strategy to operation, First, we have the themes. Uh, themes is the area where we are going to work and where the problem, where is the problem that you have to solve. Okay. Uh, let's uh, to make make it clear. Let's use an example from the oil gas, oil and, and oil and gas sector. Uh, let's say that the team is water supply and treatment in an uh, exploration field. Okay, this is water supply and treatment. 
Then we have the challenge. We build the, the challenge, which is a problem that the company has in a specific team. In our example, the challenge could be the difficulty in removing, removing particulate silica waste. So this is the problem and the team is water supply and treatment, okay? Then you go to technology and solutions. That's the next step, which are, uh, we two different uh, technolog technological approach available to solve the, the challenge. Let's say that in our example, uh, we decide to use biological precipitation. That's the technology where we are going to find a solution for the challenge. And the requirements, finally, they reflect the characteristics and parameters that technology needs to have or perform to solve the problem. There are conditions that have to, full, have to be fulfilled. Uh, in our example, let's say that we have requirements that, for example, has to be a continuous flow, a minimum flow of, let's say, 25 cubic meters per hour, and a maximum cost of $1 million. So in this way, you build the technologi technological challenge, okay? So the small company will try to solve it. But let's see how it's, it works in practice. Okay. This is a process flow. The first step is to prospect large companies that anchor companies I showed before. We interview them, we debate, we study, we define the themes and the problems they want to solve. That's the first step. It takes some time to do it. Then the second step is the technological prospect. That when look, we study for uh, the best available and appropriate technology, technology to solve the problem. Then in this step, we design the technological challenge and the output is a technological prospect report. Then we have this step three, that is the public notice. We, we prepare the public notes, register startups and small companies, and define the technological partners. In parallel, just to, in parallel, we map stakeholders. We identify funds, research institutions, universities, regulatory institutions, uh, I mean, all uh, potential partners that we have, we have for this arena. Next step, selection of startups and small companies that has participated in the public notice. The sixth step, this, this step six is where the whole of Sebra is very important because here Sebra is going to support the small business and uh, in the elaboration of the business plan, in the preparation of the innovation program, the guidance for obtaining financing, uh, discuss the prop prop intellectual property, and guiding how to prepare pitch to sell themselves and so on. So this is the core of, of our uh, uh, work in this process. The next two steps are the technological arena itself. This is a, a, a event that can be in person or virtual depending on the moment that it will take place, when it will happen, and where we put together all the players. The big company presents itself and its challenge. The small company presents its pitch. Uh, they negotiate with each other. 
uh, they talk to universities, research centers, they talk to funds, try to get financing. Everybody talks to everybody, trying to find uh, to build a partnership between them so they can uh, make uh, viable, make it viable to, to, to find us technological solution for the large company. So in the end, after discussion, discussing conditions of the partnership, uh, discussing financing, the milestones, uh, intellectual property, they sign a contract and a project development. So process. This is the flow of the process of our technological arena with this methodology. We are keen on putting small companies in the international market with innovation and creativity. Okay. Uh, currently, we are in this second, we are developing this work with Abidan, as I said, we are now in the step two running this phase and uh, probably by the end of this year we finalize this this phase here and the public notice will be launched probably in january or february 2021 next year and so small companies uh, pay attention to subscribe ourselves in this public notice and the arena will probably take place in July or August next year during the nuclear trade and technology uh, exchange that I, I said before. Well, uh, I'm time so it's what I, I'd like to present. I, I, I hope this presentation has encouraged small companies to participate in the technolo technological arena. Okay, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention, your time, and uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Philip. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Mauricio. Uh, I mean, this is a proper approach and a, a clear demonstration that uh, in any project, of course, but even more for a nuclear project, uh, there are many areas uh, for developing local solutions that will definitely improve the localization, the skills, and the know-how in the country. And working for nuclear, I mean, definitely this is developing on the very long term because projects are here for a very long term. So I think this is a very interesting approach. We have a last speaker. Uh, Rodrigo Viana is an industrial engineering uh, with specialization in business intelligence. Uh, currently works as a market intelligence analyst at the Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, APEX, working on evaluating and identifying potential markets for Brazilian exports, with the main goal of assisting Brazilian companies and partner institutions in finding the best business opportunities abroad. Uh, Rodrigo will explain what APEX is and will present on country analysis. Please, Rodrigo, the floor is yours, and may I ask you to make it in 15 minutes so we have just Maybe we can have five minutes for a wrap up at the end. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody's seeing my screen. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much, all my colleagues, for the great presentation that they did. I would also like to thank Salso Cunha as well as Orpet uh, and all our, our other colleagues from Abdan for the invitation, as well as for the help and support that they provided us during this work. Uh, we at Apex are a specialist in foreign trade and investment attractions to Brazil and ally our knowledge with the nuclear sector specific knowledge uh, of Abidan was essential to make the result of this work as solid as possible. Um, so let's begin. First of all, I think it's important to give some context for those who don't know Apex Brazil about what it does. Uh, Apex Brazil is the Brazilian trade investment promotion agent that works to promote Brazilian products and services abroad and to attract foreign investments to strategic sectors of the Brazilian economy. So I listed here some of its main activities. Uh, uh, we did entrepreneurial training, internationalization strategies, business and image promotion, investment attraction, 
And finally, uh, marketing intelligence, in which I work directly with. Uh, we are responsible for developing studies and webinars, analyzing some specific region or sector, or both together. Uh, we also developed some marketing intelligence tools, such as dashboards, panels. And we also, besides many other things, use some internal methodology to figure out what are the best countries to put more effort in, uh, considering many different possible activities to improve company's foreign sales or investment attractions of a specific sector. And this last topic is the one that contemplates the work that we did together with Abda and that I will present to you today. Uh, so, we divided this specific work in four main work forms that had some difference between them, the actions taken. First of all, we have two different sector analyzed here, one for nuclear energy, the two squares on the left, and another one for nuclear medicine, the two squares on the right of the screen. Inside the sectors, we also divided them in the ones that focus on exports, the two squares on the, on the top, investment at Actions, there is the two squares on the bottom of the slide. And with this division, we have these four different work fronts. This work included five main activities that I will talk more specifically in the sequence of the presentation. Uh, the first step was to define the HS6 that we would consider in our foreign trade analysis. For those that don't know, uh, HS6 represented the, the harmonized system which the code used globally to identify a product that is being imported or exported uh, between countries. The HS6 is the more specific that a product can go globally, consists in a code with six digits. Uh, uh, we can get more details of a product by using a code called NCM, but this code is specifically used by the Mercosul countries and because of that is not the focus of this analysis. Uh, second, we defined the, a country's long list on which the analysis were, were made. Third, we defined the, the variables that will be considering the country ranking model. And finally, we run it, our model and identified some of the prospects for each of our work groups. Uh, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about the HS6 definition. Together with Abidan, uh, we analyzed all the, the products, all the HS6, that had some relations to the nuclear energy or nuclear medicine sector, and we divided those uh, that would have some specific relation with the, the sector that we are analyzing. Uh, although uh, we don't have a, a limitation number of HS6 that we can use in our model, uh, many times, when considering a very large number of HS6, some of these products uh, end up being related to multiple sectors and not only the, the nuclear one, uh, which as a result would not give such a precise answer and values in relation to our goals. So, for example, if it's, uh, it's not interesting to consider a scroll as on HS6, because although it's part of many machines used in the nuclear sector, it's part of many other machines of many other sectors as well. Uh, so due to time, I will not go from one by one HS6 here, but the intention was to give more of an overview about what was contemplated in our trade variables. So we consider it uh, nine HS6 for the nuclear energy analysis and six for the nuclear medicine one. Uh, so uh, after that, we can talk about our second step. There is the country's long list definition. Uh, to define the, the country's long list, which we usually use 40 countries, something around that, we aligned a simplistic data analysis with the knowledge and expertise of our Abdan colleagues. So, uh, for the first analysis, we used only two variables for each work front. So we used Brazilian exports to each country and total imports of each country for the export work front and Brazilian imports from each country and total exports to each country, the, the reverse flow for the investment attraction front using the, the same HS6 for both. With the results of the countries that stood out in these variables, uh, we talked to uh, our Abdan specialists 
to define the total group of countries in each work front. For each of them, we consider them uh, 38 countries, okay, for this analysis. So as you can see in, in, the, in the map, uh, we have a bunch of similar countries, but we also have some distinction between these two work fronts. We have much more uh, South America countries in the export work front. And on the other hand, we have more uh, Middle East, more European Union countries in the investment attraction work front. We have some changes in the North Africa countries considered. And just to mention some examples here, okay? Uh, following the sequence, we can talk a little bit more about the variables definition that we consider it in our model. Uh, we divided our model and our analysis in five different performances blocks for the export front that I will present here as an example. For the investment attraction front, we used an additional block that is very specific for the investment attraction topic. Okay, so for the, the five uh, blocks here, uh, we use trade volume, uh, trade growth, competition, macroeconomics, and the sector specific one. I will talk very briefly about each one of them just to give you some context about the variables used. Uh, the first one is the trade volume block that used the HS6 defined previously to calculate what's the total value of some foreign trade variable. Uh, as, as, a, uh, uh, as an example, I, I as an example, and for the ones that don't know, uh, the relative symmetric import uh, vocation uh, shows a country's ability to import a product in, pro in proportion to the size of its economy. Uh, it's also considerable, considered variables related to the total sector imports and Brazilian exports to each country. And for the investment attraction work front, we have the same variables, but with the opposite flow considered. The trade growth uh, block, unlike the previous block that looks at the total uh, trade value, is composed with variables that analyze the market dynamics. So it evaluates the growth of the variables presented in the previous slide, both in a percentage and in a gross way. And as mentioned before, uh, for the investment attraction front, we have the same variables, but with the opposite flow. The third block wants to see how the competition in each country and the specialization of the country itself could impact or compromise Brazilian exports to them. So I'm showing in this slide examples of the main variables considered in this block for the data analysis. As an example, and for the ones that don't know, the revealed symmetric comparative advantage shows the export potential of any country with respect to the other partners. Uh, it's worth emphasizing again that for investment attraction, we consider the opposite flow. The fourth block is the only one that's not directly related to the nuclear sector. It considers the macroeconomics of each country as a whole, uh, analyzing variables related to GDP or to some World Bank index, such as the logistic performance ones or the trade across border indicator. Uh, as well, we use it also the, the popula some population variables. And finally, we also use variables about consumer spending for the medicine sector and gross fixed capital formation for the energy one, uh, with the difference related to the main characteristics of each sector. For the sector specific block, uh, we have here first, first the first front, there is the nuclear energy work front. We collected 45 different variables here, 19 of which we use it for the calculation of the export front and 39 for the calculation of the investment attraction front, with the other being just informative ones. And so some examples here of the variables used are the net energy consumption, the final consumption by each segment, the energy price for different uses, the nuclear energy and the thermal energy generation, the number and the capacity of the nuclear reactors and the constructions and the nuclear waste, the, and many others. Uh, just, just some examples here. And finally, we have the variables used for the nuclear medicine sector. For the ones, uh, for this one, we used five variables for the export front and 14 for the investment attraction front. We use variables about the internal sales of each country, such as the sales of diagnostic imaging, radiation apparatus, 
scintigraphic apparatus, uh, image and parts accessories, and also some export uh, variables such as electrocardiograph exports and contrast media exports. Uh, after can you make it in three minutes now? Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, after defining and collecting all the variables referring to the country selecting the long list, we are able to apply our ranking, country ranking model to evaluate each country prospects. Uh, the way that we do this is by normalizing the distribution of each variable between the 38 countries, dividing all the values that we obtained by one of four possible values or grades, minus one, one, three, and five. With that said, I'm showing this slide an example of a spreadsheet containing some of the variables analyzed in our model. We put together all the variables of each work font in the same spreadsheet and give grades for each value of each, of each variable. Of, of each country as well. Um, in the end, each performance blocks receive the grade that represents the mean between all of their variables. And the final grade is the mean normalized between the final uh, grade of each performance block. Finally, in the last step, I will show a little bit of how we present the insights generator for each work front, choosing four countries that had a good performance in each one of them. Because of the time I used uh, as an example the nuclear medicine export uh, work from to show a little bit of the insights that we generated during this work process. Uh, so the map shows us where the countries that received the better grades in green, the, uh, the countries that received the grade three is in yellow, the countries that received one is in orange, and minus one in red. Uh, considering all the variables of the model, it's the final grade of each country. Uh, I choose four countries here that received good grades between five or three to show some of the characteristics that contributed to consider them as one of the main prospects for this work front. Uh, uh, I will exemplify this use in the United States. As you can see, the country had the highest total imports in the sector, as well as, as the highest Brazilian exports in the sector, the biggest diagnostic image sale, total sales, and the biggest radiation apparatus total sales. On the other hand, it's important to mention some of the weakness of the country so that if an action is taken there by company or by the entity itself, it takes this country's weakness into account, creating strategies to get around this possible problem. So it's important to mention the uh, United States weakness that USA had one of the biggest drops in sector imports since 2014, and also that it's the second largest export in the sector with, due to the possible specialization of the country can compromise the exports there. We do this analysis to all the 38 countries considered on the list. Uh, here I just brought some insights in a very summarized way, but throughout the, the work itself, we went in much more depth into all the selected countries in our long list and a much larger number of variables. Uh, so just to show without presenting further details, I can uh, uh, see, we can see the result of the other work front in the sequence, starting with the nuclear energy exports. Uh, you can see here in the screen. We have also the investment attraction for nuclear medicine results. Also here, we found the grades in all the countries and some insights. And finally, we have the results for the nuclear energy investment attraction work front. We have also the insights of each country and the final grades of each one of them. They have different grades for all these work fronts because we consider different variables depending on the scope of each work front. And just to, to finish, just to conclude, I would just show a very, very brief video. Uh, uh, he presents our tool, the tool that we, we use to structure and to facilitate the generation of insights and scenarios assessment. And we can see all the countries and its final grade, its final grades. In the second part here shown, we can basically uh, choose any work front, any sector, any country related to them. And when clicking in apply, we can see all the variables that the country stood out the most, those that it got a five on the left, and those variables that the country performed poorly, getting a minus one on the right. This gives us a clear view of the strength and weakness of each one of the countries that we selected. You can also see that as I change the, the country in the second part, uh, they will change also uh, after this, this, this presenting the second part. In the third part, they will show us the complete, uh, uh, the complete topic, the complete block variables. 
So uh, this third part is linked to the country selected in the second part and shows the complete number of variables for a given performance blocks. We can vary between any of the blocks of each work front, have a complete view of the block. And, and, and also, finally, we have a fourth part of the file. We can also select in this part uh, any, count, uh, any work front, any country. But in this part, instead of select only one country, we, can must, you, we must select two to compare them. In this example, I select two countries that were well evaluated in terms of nuclear medicine export work front. And by clicking on the button, the tool shows which country does better in each block of, uh, of analysis and in the final grade as well. It also shows in which variable each country outperformed the other and which variables the two countries have considerable difference between them. One country receiving a five and the other a one or a minus one on the same variable or a country received a three and the other one a minus one on the same variable. Okay, so the country that does the best is marked in green and the country that does the worst is marked in, in red. So uh, I think that's it. So this was a little bit of, uh, of what I would like to briefly show you about the work we have done together with Abida in order to give some directions to the entity about which would be the key countries to spend effort developing some actions in it or with it and what are the pros and cons of each one of them. Again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone that is watching. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. I mean, uh, this is a very I mean, fascinating topic. Uh, it's a nice thing. To, I mean, I mean, uh, transition for, for maybe the conclusion uh, of this interesting panel, because country rankings, this is one of the key important things when you consider I mean, lending and providing money. The other thing is also the structuring. And, uh, and the contract and the risk allocation uh, between the parties. Uh, and then we have uh, this interesting question I wanted to, to raise, uh, which is as follows. Um, as it pertains to financing of new nuclear projects, if we are to achieve the target growth of hundreds of megawatts, how is financial structuring changing to enable new projects to be executed? The current models are not adequate. So I will turn to, to Milton. Uh, it would be kind of a conclusion. Uh, do you have any answer, very short answer you could provide to, to our audience? Yes. Uh, there we go. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I wish there was a, a simple answer. You know, the simple answer would be, we need to find models like they're doing in the UK with the re-regulated asset-based model. Because obviously if you can find a model that uh, where you can put more risk on government and, and get closer to government uh, cost of capital, that would be the lowest cost of capital you can have. But at the same time, that's not a full answer because the real way you get the cost of capital down is by improving the performance on projects. If performance improves a lot and the risk is perceived to be low, you'll raise low capital. And the final point I'll make on that is anybody who's already looked at the World Energy Outlook for 2020, which only came out a few weeks ago, you'll see they actually have a special few paragraphs on looking at the cost of capital for solar projects because they, it's the same sort of thing. They said, well, financing costs are 20 to 50% of the cost of energy. And they're finding that with now there's so many projects, depending on the policies in different countries, that the cost of capital has become very, very low. And that's because two things, one is, you can get low cost of capital by accessing good funds, but the other is as you have structures where there's a lot of certainty in the cash flow, and that means you know the revenues and you now know the cost of implementing the project. So, so I hope that answers the question. It's not simple, but right now the structure, the best way to get a low cost, of, we have to get structures that are more collaborative and less people working against each other. You know, the UK sort of integrated product project delivery model is, is a good one. Everybody has to be pointed at the same direction and the focus has to be on success. And I'll leave it there for me. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. I think this is a, a nice way to conclude. It opens up for many, many other topics. Uh, but definitely we we are we run out of time I, I would like to to thank you all the speakers i mean for for their presentations those were are going to be made available 
on, on the website of uh, the Wellcare uh, University or the Abdan. Uh, I would thank also for the organization. Uh, thank you for attending, attendance and all the best for Angra 3 and the Brazilian nuclear program. Uh, have, a good uh, have a good night and, uh, and be safe. Bye-bye.